Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this webinar about inflation, policy responses, and implications for global markets. My name is Faye Hoffman, and I'm an associate at Austrian Financial, and I'll be our moderator for today. So during this webinar, our speaker, Trevi, will talk about the information sensitivity of debt and financial crisis and discuss potential consequences of rising inflation. So without further ado, let's introduce our speaker. Trevi Dong is a lecturer in financial economics at Columbia University and chief economist at Austrum Financial. Prior to joining the Department of Economics at Columbia in 2010, he was a visiting assistant professor at Yale University and an assistant professor at the University of Mannheim in Germany. His re research spans the fields of financial contracting, financial intermediation, financial crises, and the Chinese financial system. Together with his long-term Co academic co-authors Gary Gordon from Yale and Noble Holmstrom from MIT. He has proposed a new and influential information sensitivity theory of debt and financial crises. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. We'll first talk about, um, we'll go over our executive summary. We'll then talk about the approach, the information sensitivity view, and Trevi will talk about inflation as a key trigger of policy change. Trivi will then discuss the non-sustainability of low interest rates in global markets and introduce us to information sensitivity theory of debt and financial crises. We'll then talk about the consequences of policy changes and at the end we'll have a Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and we will answer them at the end. Okay, so that's my turn now, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, so what I want to do today is to discuss a very hot topic. You can hear a lot in the news, but I will take uh, the uh, specific perspective. Yeah, so I will use uh, the theory that I was uh, developing with my co-author, as she said, Gary Gordon and Ben Holmstrom. Yeah, so what I want to do, so this is a summary. So as we can see, there's a lot of uh, discussion about high inflation. And then what will be the consequence of high inflation? Basically, it will need some induce the Fed, right, and the ECB to force the Fed and ECB to raise the uh, interest rate. And then possibly also to reduce uh, the purchasing of a bond, so-called a quantitative easing. Or even more, they may be forced to sell their bond holdings. Yeah, it's called a quantitative uh, tightening. So that's a too important a change in uh, central bank policy. So the question is, what are the implications of this for, for the financial system and then also for the economy. So here, as I mentioned, I will use the information sensitivity theory to first discuss how we get there. So we'll show you some picture in a second. And then uh, the point is they use this, the Fed and then the uh, ECB to rescue the system in 2008 and uh, 2020 yeah, by doing uh, especially a QE. So it turned out to be very effective in recreating a confidence and so-called information insensitivity in money and uh, debt uh, funding markets. So that they can, uh, could uh, function again. In 2008 and then 20, beginning March, basically these markets uh, break down. Yeah, so that's where we get to the situation as of now. And then now the question is what happens if the Fed reverse all these actions, especially uh, QE and then all, moreover quantitative tightening. So our claim or perspective will be, it will necessarily increase uh, the information sensitivity and then of these markets and then reduce confidence in money and in debt funding markets. So, so basically in order to not create a big panic, the Fed needs to manage the uh, expectation. So otherwise the, the claim or the, the hypothesis will be it could trigger a breakdown of uh, money and uh, funding markets. And this has a huge consequence for the whole financial system. So it leads basically to large uh, sell-off of uh, all types of uh, assets, including uh, stocks and uh, real estate, and then leading to a price uh, declines of these uh, assets. And this will have a huge impact on, uh, on the economy. And that will be basically my talk. Yeah, I would use a specific uh, perspective to look at uh, what will happen if inflation falls the Fed and ECB to uh, reduce, to reverse, what I did uh, in the last uh, 12 years. Yeah, so that's uh, the, the topic. So what is the information sensitivity theory? 
So I will spend some time. So that's an overview of my talk. So you, I will zoom in in a second. Yeah, so the first picture shows inflation. And now it's even higher. This is a month ago. So 7.5%. You will see it in a second in the US. And you can ask, uh, is the situation sustainable? And then I will show you four pictures that shows the current situation is uh, possibly not sustainable. So meaning the Fed and the ECB would have to reverse uh, what they did in the last uh, 12 years. Yeah, so one is the implication on the yields, the current situation of the, the yields of the government bonds. And then uh, the other big thing, it's uh, the balance sheet of the Fed and uh, the ECB. Yeah, you see the numbers pretty huge. And then the question is now, what I want to discuss on the right hand side box, yeah, what happens if inflation will go up? Further, it will force, I think, uh, um, the central banks to raise the interest rate and then uh, taper QE or even do a QT. And then uh, and I will use uh, this framework to discuss possible impacts on uh, funding markets. I claim this is the, the key thing in the financial system. Uh, funding markets are break down, everything will be collapsing. That's what we have seen in uh, 2008 and uh, 2020. And then this has an impact on the credit markets and the stock markets and the real economy. And this will be my talk in some sense. I want to show you what is the situation now, how we get there, and then why we get there using the theory I will propose. And then what happens if we have to reverse this action and will it create a panic? So I want to zoom in the picture. So what do we see as of today? So the inflation in the different regions. So the yellow line is the US. Now it's 7.5 percent, right? In January 2022, so possibly we we'll keep a rising or be that high for a while. And so this, you see whether this is sustainable you know, for prices of the government bonds and then, uh, the balance sheet of the Fed. And similarly, in the uh, in, uh, EU, European Union, so there uh, a month ago it's a 4.9. So I think these days is even a bit higher, 5. Point and something. Yeah, but China is exactly the opposite. So they just announced it's a 0 0.9. It's also an interesting question, how does the system diverge? Yeah. So that's the trigger, the claim. This will have implication for the responses of the central banks. And then, so I will show you two or four pictures showing why the situation as of now is possibly not sustainable. And so one is I want to show you a picture about the interest rate in the, in the US. Yeah, so look at the five years uh, yields of uh, US Treasury bonds. Yeah, so starting in, uh, already in 2000, things get uh, close to negative. And especially after the pandemic, the whole thing becomes a negative. Meaning if you buy a US Treasury bonds with constant five years maturity, and then, um, and then uh, adjusted for inflation, you will make a loss of uh, minus 2%. You yeah, can ask how long are investors are willing to do this? buying bonds and then uh, suffer a loss of two uh, percent and that's uh, the case in the uh, us and you, if you look at the 10 years it's uh, 0 0.8 minus 0 0.8 yeah and then uh, even shorter term it's uh, even higher yeah so that's uh, one thing so the, the question is whether this slope curve will go up yeah, driven uh, or the market will rise raise this uh, bring down prices and then yields will go up. Yeah, so that's the one thing that's in the uh, US and then in Europe, it's even more extreme. So if you look at uh, Germany, this is the uh, yields of German government bonds. So I didn't have the latest uh, number here, but it's not uh, that different than the yellow curve. So what you see, it's uh, very extreme. Things like this never happened in history. So the whole yield curve of the German government bonds are negative. So meaning you're buying, uh, if you buy a government bonds, of any maturity, you are losing money, real, uh, real money, not even real money, nominal money. Yeah, so the real loss adjusted for inflation is even much bigger. Yeah, so if you buy a five uh, years US German uh, government bond, you have a loss of 0.8% uh, every year. Yeah. So that's uh, the, the, the nominal. So if you add uh, inflation, the loss will be much, much bigger. Yeah, so you can ask, uh, will this be sustainable? And then the ECB is still very reluctant. I will talk about them later, why they are quite reluctant. Yeah, that's one thing. So the interest rate environment seemingly is uh, very uh, low. 
and uh, possibly not uh, sustainable if inflation uh, even uh, go uh, further higher. And that's the uh, interest rate, and I would discuss what are the implications of rising, uh, raising interest rates by the central bank. And the other bigger thing I would discuss is that I claim this is more consequential. There's less mentioned in the news, but uh, this will be more consequential uh, based on uh, the theory I will be uh, presenting. So that's again uh, something uh, brand new. The Fed starts uh, buying assets on a larger scale. So start doing this so-called uh, non uh, unconventional monetary policy. That conventional policy means uh, playing with the interest rate. Unconventional policy means uh, buying bonds you know, to support the uh, market. So they started uh, after the financial crisis, uh, during the financial crisis in uh, 2008, and then start buying uh, bonds. And then they, by doing this, I will show you, uh, they rescue the system. But instead of scaling back, they keep doing it. And then in 2020, they do another huge round of a quantitative easing. You know, they add another $4 trillion of bond purchases. And then by doing all of this, they will drive up prices. Therefore, the yields of uh, US government bonds are pretty low you know, because uh, part of it is driven by, by the Fed. And you can ask now, will the Fed uh, reduce it? First, or, or not uh, do it more, or secondly, have to shrink their balance sheet. Yeah, do they have a $5 trillion of a US uh, treasury bonds? So if they sell part of this, the question is what are the impact on the US treasury prices and then the uh, treasury yields? So this is one way how they maintain possibly uh, long-term yields, right? The effects of the long-term yields by selling a uh, long-term bonds in order to not have a yield inversion. So they may uh, do this, but the big question is how does this affect the funding markets? And when they reduce uh, this number, right? From 8.5 trillion dollar to something less. Yeah, so that's seemingly non-sustainable. Uh, given the high uh, interest uh, inflation environment, yeah, so that's uh, the US. You see the same picture in uh, Europe. Yeah? And then the ECB, like the Fed, is buying large scales of uh, bonds since the European financial crisis. So the blue thing is a public sector uh, purchase program, meaning they're buying uh, government bonds of many countries, Italy and so on. So I will discuss the implication too, when they possibly have to scale back uh, the, the blue line. Yeah. And then the other thing is uh, the yellow line is a corporate sector bonds, so they buy uh, corporate. And then the, the, the red thing is uh, something called a covered bonds purchase a program. And the small thing is asset backed security. Yeah, so it's very high. So it's un unusual to have a level like this. And I think this is the main reason why yields are negative. Uh, ECB intentionally drive yields to negative. And then the question is how long investors will be willing to accept this. Yeah, so that's a small picture that shows possibly these things will not be sustainable in the future, even in the near future. And then uh, the question is, how do we get there? And then uh, what happens if uh, they reverse uh, things? Yeah, so that, that's basically uh, what I want to discuss. Yeah, so I want to discuss this using very, one very specific uh, new uh, perspective. Yeah, it's called uh, information sensitivity theory of uh, debt and financial crisis. This is where uh, I and my, my co-author Gary Gordon and then Holmström, uh, Ben Holmstrom from MIT started working on since basically 2008. Yeah, then uh, we worked on this agenda for a long time and then we derive uh, some new measures to measure in some sense the risk and then uh, derive a theory, a new theory of a financial crisis and then also a new implication for how government and then a regulator and the central banks should intervene during a financial crisis. So our team will have very different implications than uh, what a common uh, policymaker or even other academics are proposing when it comes to intervening uh, during a financial crisis. But the first thing I want to show is uh, very briefly, what did we do? What did we derive? And then how we use this measure to, to measure basically a risk and then confidence. Yeah, in, uh, in markets, and especially in, um, in funding markets, so-called debt funding markets. And so we derived this measure called a pi low and pi high. So it's looking mathematical, but the intuition is, if you look at the, 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 blue, the green curve, right? So what is this representing? It's a payoff 
of a random uh, arbitrary uh, security, financial security. And then this uh, arbitrary security is backed by some cash flow X. So if you have thing, I will show you a standard debt contract in a second. Yes, so this can be very complicated. And then say, if you look at um, VC finance, uh, the green curve is something like this also shows up in um, uh, convertible preferred stocks. If you invest in, um, in, uh, in a startup, yeah, they have a complicated shape. So here's a general security we just uh, illustrate. And then ask if you buy this security, what do you get? You get a payoff you know, of S of X, the so-called S of X. And then uh, what you get depends on the cash flow that backs your security. Yeah, so if the cash flow is high, you will get a higher payoff from owning the security. Yeah, if the overall cash flow is low, you will earn less. So like this point. Yeah, and then what does it, the, the picture show? So you pay a price today, P, to buy the security. And then uh, what happens if you get more, you make a profit. And then if you get back less, you make a loss. So what this pi low uh, formula shows, it's a green area. You know, it says, what is your overall expected loss of owning or buying or investing in this uh, security? Yeah, this is a so-called, uh, we call it an information sensitivity of the security in the lower payoff state. And then if you look at the, 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 the other area, means in this area, you're getting a profit. Yeah, you pay P and then get back uh, something S of X higher than P. Yeah, in all these area, uh, X regions, you make a profit. So if you calculate uh, the expected profit, this is uh, denoted by uh, pi high. And this is um, the profit you can make by buying uh, uh, these, the security S of X. So I will show you a picture with a bond with a normal debt. Yeah, so how do we get there? We derive it from a complicated, in some sense, uh, model. And then the, this is the outcome. Yeah, and then the moreover, we show what really matters. It's uh, the minimum of the two. Yep. So what matters at the end for investor, whether they want to acquire information or invest in the money markets, it's at the end, uh, the minimum of the two. And we derive a completely new measure, a different measure of uh, risk. And then someone in there, uh, when they sign up for a seminar, they ask, uh, how can we quantify it? So I will show you a way how to empirically quantify this measure for different uh, financial products. And so that's, uh, loosely speaking, what we are deriving. And then based on this, we derive consequences. And if this thing go up and down, what are the behavioral consequences for investor? You know, should they keep uh, investing in money market funds or should they keep investing in uh, commercial papers? If uh, this thing of uh, money market funds and then commercial papers are changing, you know, and then we will sh um, show something in model. Yeah, before I get there, I want to show you an empirical estimate. Yeah. So hi, this is a new measure you can possibly use for risk management. Yeah, so if you apply this uh, formula and then uh, use it and then to analyze the S&P 500, then you get a picture like this. This is uh, what we call the information sensitivity of the S&P 500. So this is a 20 days moving average. I think this picture, no one has seen it before. So it's how we construct it. So you can ask, what is this picture showing? Yeah, it captures uh, the key events in the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, this is the pandemic. So it's a spike, so meaning the information sensitivity of the S&P 500 overall is going up. And then there also spiked during the financial crisis in uh, 2008, yeah, and then also during the dot-com bubble, but to a much lesser degree. Yeah, this is an empirical estimate. Someone asked, how can we do it? We can do it. Yeah. So given some assumption, you can uh, calculate uh, this measure. You know, the pi equals min of pi low and pi high for the S&P in a 20 days moving average looks like this. Yeah, so that's uh, one uh, application. And the other one I will get back also later, it's if you do it apply to US Treasury, we also get something pretty surprising. At least it surprises me when I see a picture like this. You might think US Treasuries are pretty safe. So, so we look at, we apply this uh, formula to calculate the TIT ETF. You know, so I share BlackRock and I share ETF that invest in uh, treasury bonds with a remaining maturity of uh, 20s or more years. Yeah, so then uh, you see the prices. And then given the prices, you can uh, calculate uh, the information sensitivity of TLT. And then again, it captures some uh, surprising things during the pandemic, even the US treasury markets yeah, face a uh, panic. So it spiked in, uh, in March. Yeah, so what does it mean at the end? If you look at this picture literally, 
if you invest $100, you are losing uh, uh, at least $1.5. So it's 1.5% loss in a day. But this is a moving average. I don't want to go into detail. But if, if you're interested in, you can uh, email me and I will tell you more about how to create uh, the empirical equivalence of this uh, measure. Yeah, that's one example or two examples. Uh, we claim this measure is pretty useful. And this is a new measure. It's like uh, complementing, say, uh, the value of risk, the BAR. Yeah, so that's what it is. Now I want to get back to the theory and say, now what do we, after deriving this object, and what are we doing um, in terms of uh, analyzing or understanding uh, funding markets and the run and, and the breakdowns of the uh, funding markets? Yeah, so now S of X was uh, this a very random uh, security, right? And then in reality, some of the security looks pretty complicated. But for any security, where when you see the contract, you can back out, you can write down uh, the shape. Yeah, so if you look at the standard uh, debt contract, this is a debt contract, the dotted line. So meaning if you invest in a bond and then uh, the get back $100, this is uh, the dotted line. Yeah, and then say I invest in, uh, I don't know which bond, uh, Apple's bond, and X is Apple's cash flow. Yeah, even if Apple's cash flow is uh, $200 billion, the bondholder will not get back more than uh, its face value. So that's a flat line. And then you can ask if I invest in Apple, what is my uh, expected loss of owning uh, Apple's bond? And then this is uh, the triangle. This is pi low. I can ask, what is the triangle? It's literally the triangle. And then you have to evaluate it with the probability that you end up in a loss. So if Apple's cash flow is always bigger than uh, the face value of debt, like these days, $100 billion, then uh, this is uh, the distribution of uh, Apple's cash flow. As of now, Apple uh, is pretty safe. Yeah, they have enough cash to pay back the debt. So it's above the, the face value point, right? Say the $100 billion. So Apple's debt is pretty uh, riskless. So therefore, in this example, pi low, it's a zero. And then the minimum of zero and pi high, it's a zero. So a debt like this, we call it this information insensitive. Yeah, no matter what happens with the cash flow of Apple, Apple's bond is the same. Yeah, if you know it's above $100 billion. Yeah, so that's the starting point. And this is what we argue. It's a way how funding markets function. This is the only way how funding markets function. And whenever we see a problem of things like this, phenomenon like the, the lower chart, then we get into trouble in funding markets. Yeah, so during a crisis and when there's a shift in the collateral distribution, yeah, like from the green line to the red line. So what does it mean? Then there's a positive probability that uh, if you invest in the bond, you are losing money. Yeah, that's what we call now sensitive to information. Yeah, if you know this, you will have to look at what is the realization of X. Yeah, this will determine the value of your bond holding. Yeah, so with a red distribution, meaning there are positive probabilities, like in the Apple case, the total face value is uh, something $100 billion. And then, for example, Apple can have a total cash flow of $80 billion. Then there's a $20 billion loss, a $200 billion loss, a $20 billion loss of, um, for Apple's bond holder. And then this will make Apple's uh, bond more information sensitive. And then we argue later, this is the main reason why we see uh, problems in so-called uh, funding markets. And then when this thing happened, it's a huge implications for everything in the financial system. And when funding markets face stress, then this is a huge problem for, for everything in the financial system. Yeah, that's our theory. Yeah, so that's based on this. And then we formalize this. So our model is a kind of a microeconomic model. And then we have a rational, very sophisticated uh, players, institution, and they can anticipate everything. And they're able to calculate everything what I was uh, describing. It's very sophisticated. And then I will show you even empirical evidence how sophisticated uh, these people in reality are. That's not only in the model. Yeah, so now our theory says, you know, once you have this measure, so what happens is whenever this thing go up, yeah, the pi low or the pi go up, meaning the collateral becomes risky backing uh, these bonds, then the information sensitivity uh, go up. Yeah, that becomes more sensitive to information. And then what are the consequences in the model? 
and then we can test it uh, with data what are the consequences in the reality is that prices of these bonds go down and then at the same time by definition the yields will go up yeah, but moreover people get uh, nervous and then they will produce information and then uh, the consequence of producing information is is we reduce uh, liquidity in this market and the problem is really if someone can learn and some other people are less sophisticated and they're trading with a sophisticated trader and then uh, if you face this situation possibly it's best not to trade at all and that's our model so if someone sophisticated starts producing information about uh, commercial papers asset backed securities and so on this will create a technically called an adverse selection and this is the main causes we argue for the breakdown or the problems in the funding markets that these markets cannot work if there's an asymmetric information and you can ask whether this is backed by evidence and then uh, and then uh, this is a theory and then uh, this is a mechanism we propose and then this theory has inspired a new literature yes they are basically designed there are many papers that are designed explicitly using larger data sets to test uh, the theory to test this mechanism yeah and then we summarize uh, some of them in this uh, survey paper and then they provide pretty strong evidence yeah, for this mechanism and whenever depth becomes information sensitive this happens meaning less trace means in the end as a less consequence there's a run or breakdown so no one is willing to lend yeah so that's uh, leading to the financial crisis and then what the, i will show you later what the fed is doing yeah, they make that this information sensitive depth less sensitive and then what happens if this becomes less sensitive the reverse happens the yeah, prices of bonds go up yields go down people learn less there's more trade yeah so the question in the talk will be we are at the moment here because the fed uh, and then ecb uh, leads us to the situation but if they do uh, the reverse triggered by uh, by uh, inflation will we get back to the old situation yeah so that's the big uh, question and then the theory will make a pretty strong predictions and yeah, what can happen in the worst case with a change of a monetary policy especially unconventional so i claim uh, interest rate is not a big impact but the qe will be a huge impact possibly yeah, for the functioning of the financial system yeah so that's our theory yeah so here one example what happens in 2008 and then I will show you one very sophisticated uh, paper, how they test this mechanism. It's very sophisticated. How they measure information production by a real sophisticated uh, institutional investor. Yeah, so what is the mechanism? So I highlight the mechanism. It's uh, for 2007. And one trigger is a falling housing prices. So when the housing bubble crash or start uh, going down, then the meaning if you buy a house and then get a mortgage, you may have incentive to default strategically. Yeah, you know the house is overpriced, and I don't want to pay, so I default on my mortgages. So what does it mean if these mortgages are used as collaterals in other assets, like a mortgage-backed securities? Then they become information sensitive too, right? So they are losing a value. Yeah, the owner of this uh, MBS will not get a repay fully because the underlying mortgage uh, doesn't repay. So then this makes mortgages, MBS, and information sensitive. So MBS prices will fall. And at the same time, it's also what we will show, uh, it's information sensitivity go up. And then what are the consequences? The consequences, borrowers that use these uh, collateral, MBS, like Lehman, and have a huge MBS uh, portfolio of $300 billion. They use it as collateral and to borrow on something called the repo market. And then borrower like banks, firms, MMF, money market mutual funds, which uh, owns these assets on the balance sheet. And when these assets become uh, information sensitive, the collateral value go down, meaning this, uh, the borrower can borrow less in funding markets, in commercial papers market, asset backed commercial papers. Yeah. The point is in the institutional investor, the other counterparty, they don't want this collateral anymore. And then what are the consequences? They stop lending. Yeah, trading volume go down because collateral becomes uh, information sensitive. And then another consequence is these borrower, Lehman and all these other firms, 
that used to borrow every day billions of dollars on the repo and in the CP market will face a bankruptcy problem. If they are not able to repay their short-term liability, they are bankrupt. You know, and then if these uh, firms, banks, and MMA are bankrupt, this will also cause big problems for their counterparties. And they're doing business with many other banks and other companies. And then meaning the other firms will also lose the money. Yeah, this is a mechanism. And then at the end, if you're rational, you anticipate all of this, you immediately stop lending. So all funding and credit markets break down. That's the financial crisis in 2008. Our interpretation of what's going on in 2008. Yeah, that's the, the theory. So I just want to show you one paper. Um, there are many now measuring this thing using uh, real data. Yeah, how this is a claim, right? We claim when uh, bonds becomes information sensitive, someone wants to learn. Yeah, and then uh, the study shows, and then uh, this is, I think, uh, true in general, sophisticated institutional investors are very responsive to what we call information sensitivity. If this thing go up, these investors will acquire information. And then one example is there's a paper that looks into the money market mutual fund and then look at behavior of money market mutual fund investor. Yeah, and then what they are doing during the European financial crisis in 2011. Yeah, so at some point in time, June 15, Moody downgrade a lot of European banks. So meaning bonds of European banks becomes information sensitive. And as these bonds becomes information sensitive, money market mutual funds who owns a lot, big part of these bonds becomes information sensitive. So the consequence is if investor invested in the MMF, the claim is they have incentive to look at the holdings of this MMF. Yeah, and then at the end, if they see, they really require information, if they see this money market mutual funds owns this bond, that becomes information sensitive. What are they doing? They withdraw money. Yeah, they don't want to trade with MMF anymore. So they run to them, there's a run on MMF. This is what we saw in uh, 2008 in the US. And when the reserve fund uh, break a bucket, this trigger a whole run on the US and MMF. And then the only way to rescue it, it's when the Fed say we, we guarantee everything. That's how they uh, rescue MMF. Yeah, you can see, can we measure things like this? And then this paper is pretty amazing. They measure this. And yeah, they look at all holdings uh, of MMF by all institutional investors. They have this data. Yeah, there's an MMF, and then they know exactly who is owning uh, this MMF, investing in this MMF. And then what is this uh, paper doing? They track web traffic of these institutional investors. And they say the red line is at the day when Moody downgrade uh, European banks bond. And then what happens? Is, and then the, moreover, they, they look into the classified you know, institutional investor according to their sophistication. You know, if you're a hedge fund, you post your, your, um, store your money with an MMF, they are considered as more sophisticated. It's called high sophisticated. And then other institutional investors are called low and middle sophisticated. Yeah, they classified investor investing in the MMF according to three classes. So what do they see on average? The scaling is also already different in normal times. So in general, high sophisticated institutional investors look more into information. Yeah, so this is a 50 person, 50 institutional investor in some sense, look into information of the MMF per one per 10,000 uh, per 10,000 uh, accounts. Yeah, and then um, and then uh, the right hand side is the number of uh, clicks in some sense by middle and low sophisticated institutional investor. So it's a magnitude of uh, ten smaller, and that's normal time. So there are around fifty people per one per ten thousand accounts that uh, look into information, meaning they go to the website and they click on a web page and check what is the holding of the, the MMF, and then we see a spike. Yeah, so it went up uh, basically uh, four times. So seemingly more institutional investors are looking at the uh, MMF holdings. Yes, but they acquire information. And then after acquiring information, when they see that the other uh, interesting part of the paper, they look at their behavior. So what do they see? They see an outflow. Now again, they, they classify the high and low, and then the so-called intersects with uh, what they find. 
So if they see an MMF holding a lot of Italian bank bonds, this is called a higher uh, estimated loss and maturity. The uh, uh, MMF that owns a lot of these bonds becomes a uh, pretty information sensitive. Yeah, if you are uh, if you find out the MMF doesn't own uh, many of these uh, risky bonds, it's a low expected loss and maturity, it's a red line, they don't withdraw. Yeah, they stick with the uh, MMF. But if they see yeah, who acquires information and see uh, the MMF owns risky bonds, they withdraw very quickly, 10% you know, of the MMF uh, assets. And then another part I didn't show is as a consequence, MMF rebalance the asset holding you know, to make it uh, information insensitive. So that's uh, one study you know, that uh, provide evidence that supports our theory you know, that uh, whenever bonds becomes information sensitive, especially in the funding markets, investors behave like this, that they run, they want their money back. And this creates a huge problem for the financial system. And that's one thing, right? And then you can ask, I don't want to go too much into detail. And if you look at history, you see exactly the same thing happening in March 2020. But the point is that the Fed acted very quickly. So they save everything by providing unlimited support. And then we see it also throughout history. That's why I don't want to go too much. Yeah, so that's the theory. And then what, what is the model, uh, what can the model explain? So what did the Fed and ECB do? They do something like this. By buying bonds, this is a normal loss, right? If they buy bonds, they put up a lower bound on bond prices. That's yeah, so meaning they reduce uh, the information sensitivity. If they buy enough, these things go to zero. Yeah, and, then, uh, and then this creates, in some sense, confidence in funding markets. And then when people have confidence in funding markets, they're willing to lend. And then if this market works, then have a positive spillover to other credit and bond markets. So by, by doing a QE, the Fed and ECB recreate the liquidity, not only in the funding markets, but for the whole financial system. That's how we ended up uh, these days, why the balance sheet of the Fed is uh, so big. And now getting back to the main topic of the talk, what happens with rising inflation? And what is the central bank doing? I think they will do it uh, sometimes in the near future, possibly. First, to stop uh, QE. Second, possibly to, to, to reduce their bond holding. So what is the implication now, right? It's just reversing the picture. Yeah, so here they create a, make markets information insensitive by doing the, the opposite. The claim is they will make markets information sensitive. That the lower bound is gone. And if the Fed doesn't buy uh, bonds, there's no price support. And then moreover, if they sell bonds, you know, some uh, of their $5 trillion US Treasury, part of it, this put on even more uh, pressure on prices. And then uh, the information sensitivity of uh, even US Treasury will go up. Yeah, so that's a consequence of yeah, this theory. This will be the implication. And then you can ask, what are the further implications of a reversal of a QE? Yeah, so what is the consequence? Yeah, so instead of buying bonds, the Fed is selling bonds possibly. And then it means it will increase uh, the information sensitivity of money market instruments. And then the model predicts prices will go down yeah, just by this. And then moreover, since the Fed doesn't buy much and then even sell, demand will go down, supply will uh, go up, then uh, this reduces liquidity in funding markets. Yes, and then when funding markets uh, becomes uh, problematic, this will have a negative spillover to other credit markets, the loans and then the corporate bond markets. And then the problem is now weaker issuers like uh, corporate and financial firms might face a funding and refinancing problem. And not because only interest rates go up, but because people are less willing to buy uh, these bonds. Yeah, so that's a possible consequence of a uh, QT, quantitative tightening. And then here are some examples. What, so I, I claim right, this can be a big problem if uh, the Fed sells the uh, US Treasury. And then even you can ask, is the market uh, big enough right, to absorb uh, the selling of uh, US Treasury by, uh, by the Fed? So if you look, go back to the pandemic, that is my picture in the beginning, you can see something uh, possibly surprising. It says here in March 20, the trading or selling of uh, US Treasury bonds overwhelmed the capacity of uh, bond market makers. 
and they're not willing, they're not able to buy all the bonds, even treasury bonds. Someone is selling. So meaning prices uh, go down. So the losses uh, of uh, owning a treasury bonds go up. And then can might come back, come down, it's uh, the Fed that they, they, they buy. Yeah. So if the Fed starts selling, the question is, will this thing show up again in the near future? Yeah, when there's a huge uh, disruption of a uh, treasury bond market. Yeah, possibly, I don't know. But this is one uh, big uh, open, uh, open question. Yeah, therefore, QE can have this uh, huge, uh, QT can have this huge uh, possible negative uh, impact. Yeah, here another example why the ECB is pretty uh, hesitant in reversing what they are doing. Again, if you look at um, the pandemic in 2020, what happened without intervention, the, the funding costs for Italian bonds go up. So what is this picture showing? It's a spread between uh, Germans and then uh, Italian bonds. So this point means if you invest, uh, if you buy this, uh, the Italian bonds, yeah, they ask for the yields, it's a 280 basis point higher than the, the German uh, yield, yeah, it's above. So that's a uh, high and then in 2011, this is much, much higher. And then in normal times after the ECB again and step in during the pandemic, they buy a lot of Italian bonds and then they make it information insensitive, the spread go down to a kind of normal level of 100 basis point. That's meaning uh, the interest difference, the year difference between uh, Italian and German bonds, it's around 120 basis point. But the problem is possibly if the Fed and the ECB you know, scale back the public uh, bond purchase program, you know, so the free two point something trillion dollar, then what happens with uh, the prices of these uh, weaker countries and like uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal and so on. And will we see a spike? And then when we see a spike, this would be a, possibly a big problem for, for Italy. Now, meaning they have to pay higher interest for borrowing on, on this market. Yeah, and, then, um, and then this can uh, create a run on, uh, in some sense, where people will sell even more the Italian and uh, Spanish and bonds. And it's a possible consequence of QT in, uh, in Europe. Now, will this cause us a problem? Now, because uh, the spread is low, people, I think, invest or think the Fed will, or the ECB will buy it. This is what Mario Draghi did in 11, 2011. He ended the European financial crisis by saying, no matter who's selling, how high the yield will be, we will buy everything. We, have, we put a lower bound here on, on, the, on the bond prices of uh, Italian government bonds. There's a lower bound. No matter how many people are selling, whatever it takes, it's a very famous uh, three words, we will buy everything. Uh, investors anticipating this, they know if I own uh, Italian bonds, when I need to sell, I will not make a loss. Yeah, that's Mario Tsagi's uh, success in a sense. And he, he recreated the confidence and information insensitivity by saying, we buy everything. No matter how much uh, investors are selling, we buy everything. And yeah, they moved this uh, blue line here pretty high above, yeah, meaning there's no loss. So investing in uh, Italian bonds and Spanish bonds, it's not a big risk for institutional investor. Yeah, so that's a, uh, the big open question, what ha happens if the ECB scale back, is what I uh, scale back uh, Q QE in uh, Europe, yet they spend most of the money on uh, public uh, bonds, meaning government bonds of different countries. And when they scale it back, this can have this uh, effect. Yeah, this is a big question. And then yeah, before I end this, another point I claim in the very beginning, interest rate is not a big issue. It's a strong claim, but it's focused a lot in the, in the news. It says interest rate will go up, yeah, definitely, and then possibly sooner and then higher than uh, anticipated uh, three months ago. This is a picture showing the Fed funds uh, effective rate. This is uh, instruments they can uh, change. Yeah, so peak in the 1980s at 15%. But uh, again, after the financial crisis, they bring it down from five to zero. And then when they started tapering, it went up. But now, since the pandemic, they bring it down again. And then the big question is, inflation will force this. Yeah, it cannot be uh, zero anymore. If inflation is 5%, zero interest rate is uh, possibly too low. 
So it will definitely go up. Yeah, but the point is, what are the implications yeah, for valuations and then um, functioning? Yeah, so, so my, my claim is rising rates is less consequential. Yeah, it will affect stock valuation, definitely. It will also affect valuation of other assets, yeah, just mechanically in some sense. If you use the higher discount rate to discount future cash flow, uh, uh, prices of stocks will go down. But you can ask, so what, right? The price go down and it will go up uh, sometimes later again. So this will not have a huge impact on uh, the financial system. Possibly some losses for, uh, for a stock investor. Uh, and then, but it's not less consequential for the functioning of a funding market. And then what I try to claim and uh, mention in uh, this talk is to highlight the key thing, the key question in my opinion is how does it affect the functioning of a funding market? And if this thing doesn't work, then the firms and banks, other any financial institution, will face a huge problem in managing the, the liquidity, yeah, managing or, or paying their short-term liability. Yeah, so that's a rates increase will make it a bit costly, yeah, but this is not as huge implication of a losing, a, creating a loss of confidence. Yeah, so if you look at uh, what happening during a pandemic or uh, 2008, reducing interest rate is not effective at all. Yeah, first, they reach zero, and then uh, they cannot go lower, that's true. But uh, if you show, you can formally also show it, has no impact at all on uh, information sensitivity. No matter how low the rate is or how high the rate is, it has no impact. Yeah, so it doesn't have big impact on the funding markets, aside from basically paying a higher cost, but nothing to do with uh, confidence. Yes, so therefore I claim rising, increasing rates will be less consequential for the funding markets. Yeah, so this is not a, possibly not a huge uh, problem for the functioning. Yeah, firms have to pay a bit more, that's true, but uh, for the functioning, it uh, still works. Yeah, so the last thing is uh, this question, right, to summarize. Yeah, so what is, uh, could the reversal of the actions, especially uh, reversal of QE, not interest rate, yeah, that are implemented to rescue the financial system in 2008 and in uh, 2020 cause the opposite effect. The investor gets so used to this massive liquidity and price and support. And they say, no matter what I I'm buying, what type of bonds and so on, when there's a problem, the Fed will buy it. So I would not make a big loss by owning uh, this type of uh, uh, money market instruments. Yeah, so, but what happens if they see the Fed is uh, reducing the support? Yeah, so this can create a loss, disruptive loss of confidence. Yeah, so the key question is how does the Fed do the Fed and ECB taper QE or do a QT? How do they do it? And how can they manage expectation and without disrupting the functioning of money and funding markets? This is not the focus of many uh, public discussion in the news. They don't talk about so much about this. They just talk about the stock valuation and say when the, someone yesterday wrote, when the S&P go down to 3,700, then the Fed will step in. Yeah, but the point is, uh, it's not an important. What is the valuation of the S&P for the functioning of the financial system? But the key thing is if money and funding markets are disrupted, this is a huge uh, problem. This is the problem underlying all financial crisis throughout uh, history. And this will lead to, at the end, a huge uh, sell-off of all types of uh, assets. Because uh, firms get uh, bankrupted, financial institutions get uh, bankrupted without uh, help, then their value, their bonds, and then the stocks will lose a massive amount of uh, value. Yeah, and then this has a huge spillover to any other companies and then many other markets, and then leading at the end to the breakdown of many markets. Yeah, so that's, I think, it's uh, the main point of uh, this uh, talk, highlighting a different uh, view. There's not per se uh, interest rate that can, will cause a big problem. And also not uh, when stock uh, valuation go down, but what happens to uh, funding markets. Yeah, so the information sensitivity theory uh, can provide some uh, new conceptual way uh, to think about uh, these implications. Yeah, so I think I will stop here. Yeah, this is also my last slide. So then I, we can take maybe some uh, questions. Thank you so much, Trivi. This was extremely informative. So I have a couple of questions from the people who registered for this webinar. If you have any other questions, please 
drop them in the Q&A box and I will try to ask them too. We have like seven more minutes left. So why don't we get started on a couple of them? So the first question is, how can we quantify the information sensitivity so we can use the data for risk management? I know you already touched upon this, but maybe you can give some more context. Yeah, this is basically one thing, right? You can ask, how do I get this picture, right? This is a way to quantify it. Yeah, so you can use historical data yeah, to calculate uh, this number yeah, based on historical prices. You can uh, calculate it. Like if you say, how do I calculate the uh, empirical variance? Then you don't know the distribution, but you use uh, historical prices and to calculate the uh, historical variance, historical skewnesses of any assets. So here we use historical prices um, of the S&P, the points, and then uh, to calculate uh, the expected loss of the S&P. And then uh, take the moving average, then you can uh, this curve. And then uh, you can see it reflects uh, these uh, key market events. So if you want to learn more, you can possibly uh, email me and we can uh, discuss how to create an empirical part of this measure that we think it's pretty useful for among other things, risk management or even trading. Yeah. It's like using VAR and some other signals to look at uh, what might happen with uh, markets. Great. Another question is, how will the Fed's tightening of monetary measures affect the US and China trade? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question, right? So yeah. get back to this picture figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, diverging. Yeah, so the US is going up, Europe is going up, and then they end up in a new system. And then uh, the pink line is uh, China. Now it's going down. So China, I think, has no reason and no need to do what the US is uh, doing. Yeah, meaning to scale back uh, support of the financial system. So they can even uh, easing monetary policy can increase or uh, decrease the uh, interest rate and uh, stimulate more, possibly more investment. And then the US might be forced to do the opposite. You have to increase the uh, interest rate and then funding costs becomes higher. So possibly firms will uh, invest uh, less, possibly, I don't know. And then uh, this will affect uh, the economy and then how they basically trade, right? Yeah. This is a bit, I think this is a, also a new discussion these days. I read something in a report. They say, what should uh, China do, right? Call it an asynchronous um, a movement. Yeah, so they, they have no reason now to do what uh, the Fed and ECB is uh, doing in China, the PBOC. Yeah, yeah, so other than this, I don't know uh, what the reader or the, the audience uh, the viewer wants to hear. Yeah. So I don't know the exact number, right? I cannot tell maybe yeah. the deficit go up by, by some percent. <laughs> this will be extremely, uh, yeah. Yeah, it will be interesting yeah. to look at. Yeah, possibly, right? Can, uh, yeah, but it's hard to quantify, right? Literally. Yeah. So here it's more qualitative, my, my discussion. Mm -hmm. But you can try to quantify it, right? And say, what are the impact? But if I look at funding markets, the impact is pretty dramatic. It's basically a system switch, either it's working or not working. Yeah, so the impact will be very traumatic yeah, in funding markets. But in the stock markets, possibly still a little bit uh, smoother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if stock price go down, they still keep working, right? That's the liquidity trading and so on. But with uh, these funding markets, banks and so on, it's more uh, system change. Either it works or it stops working. So there's less something in between. That's also what we want to highlight with this research. Either funding markets works or it doesn't. That cannot work for half in some sense. Either people have confidence or no confidence. And then for these markets to work, then we claim it needs confidence. Yeah. Either you have confidence or no confidence. Yeah. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question, maybe to summarize the webinar and the presentation. So Trivi, where do you see the market heading and what is your perspective for the US economic outlook in 2022? <laughs> Again, they want something a quantity number, right? Yeah. Hard to do. Yeah, I, I have no idea whether it will be the <laughs> growth or even the exact number of inflation, but it's possibly the, the overall uh, consequence, right? So the point is uh, how does it affect at the end the uh, GDP, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I don't know exactly, right? But the claim is it uh, will cause possibly some problems in uh, the financial system. Yeah, especially uh, possibly some problems in uh, these. Uh, 
very important funding markets, mm -hmm. being a commercial paper, a separate commercial paper, repo, and so on. And this is where firms, financial institutions, manage uh, their, their liquidity. Now, if these lenders and then big players in the financial system get into problem, then this will have a huge impact on even on the real economy, right? Yeah. Meaning firms will have no way to borrow, yeah? And then uh, the firms have no way to borrow, they, they cannot uh, invest. So in terms of a number, I have no idea, right? What would be uh, the, the, the quantitative uh, impact mm -hmm. on the GDP growth or whatever? any measure you might be interested in. Great. OK, so I think we're almost at the end. So I want to thank everyone who attended this webinar so much for coming. We really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new and valuable. And please feel free to reach out to Trevi or me with further questions, comments, or feedback. And we hope to see you again soon and have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for attending. <laughs> okay, well, bye. Bye.